All right, so I think we can call to order the October meeting of the Bloomington Board of Park Commissioners. And Kim, can you start us off with the roll call, please? Yes, Kathleen Mills. Here. Les Coyne. Here. Israel Herrera. Hey, Reese, Susanna, and Ellen yeah, Brodke. Now, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> okay. All right. So we will start with the consent calendar, which we've all had a few days to look over. Um, we have a, this is approval of minutes, claims submitted from the past month, non-reverting budget items, a review of the business report, and then just a couple of items of surplus. So do we have a motion to approve the consent calendar? So move. Okay, in a second. Okay, Israel has a second. So all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All right, motion is carried. And we don't have anything under the, the public hearings. Um, we have anyone out there who would like to make a public comment um, we ask you to keep it to two minutes. That can be something on the Facebook Live, via email. We'll just pause here for a little bit as we people are coming in. We'll see if we have any public comments. <clears throat> okay. Not. Not I don't have hearing any. I don't have any okay. in my email. Okay. All right. All right. Then we will move into the other business. And first up is a review of a contract with Cornerstone Planning and Design LLC for project management. And that is over to Paula with the nice logo there. In the yes. Background. Thank yep. you. Yeah. yeah. Julie Ramey provided that for me. <laughs> which is nice for these meetings. So uh, yes, I am uh, recommending uh, the approval of the contract with Cornerstone Planning and Design LLC for man uh, project management services in the amount of $12,120 that would be um, paid from the operations general fund uh, budget. And the contract would uh, be good uh, through January 31st, 2021. And just a little bit of background, um, we actually have been working with Cornerstone, Cornerstone Planning and Design uh, since 2019, um, brought them on um, under funding from the controller's office um, to support Dave Williams, our former operations and development division director, as he was uh, overseeing Switchyard Park, but as you know, we have a large general obligation park fund project list to do and also bicentennial uh, projects. So we actually started working with Deb Schmucker back in 2019, just to support Dave and all of the projects and keep everything flowing in a timely manner. Uh, Dave has since retired from the department and the position is unfilled at the moment, although it is posted and we plan to begin interviewing later this fall. Uh, but in the meantime, um, I find it necessary to uh, continue uh, with Deb's services so that we can uh, keep projects such as the Griffey Loop Trail, the Lower Cascades Trail, um, some playground replacement projects, some lighting projects. Uh, we just still have a lot of projects ongoing and I don't want to uh, waste any time or, or come to a standstill until we fill this position. So um, we'd like to um, enter into this contract with Deb um, and uh, believe if we fill this position, the division director position here by the end of the year, um, this contract should nicely see us through the transition and keep the projects moving and everything on track. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay. Thank you for the background there. I was just thinking when I was getting set up for this meeting, I was like, oh, no, Dave Williams. Yeah. No, Dave, but I did talk to him today. Okay. He's doing well. Good. Um, and uh, he takes my calls and answers my questions. But, uh, <laughs> you know, there's so many details to a lot of these projects and uh, a lot of background work and that. And it's uh, been nice in the transition. Uh, Deb's got a good handle on all of them. And, uh, 
gives me enough information uh, to pass along to staff who are managing these projects. So it's, it's just the enough support that I need um, to keep everything moving and on, on time. Okay. All right. So can continue project management services with Cornerstone and any questions or comments from board members? I think it's a great idea. Makes a lot of sense. And Deb is very familiar with the various projects. So. She uh, knows our department well and all of our, our processes, yes. Okay. Yeah, I'd agree. I think it's nice to have some continuity there. <laughs> okay, all right. And so do we have a motion to approve the contract with Cornerstone Planning and Design LLC? Yeah, I'll you want me to motion. Yeah, go ahead. I was gonna say, why don't one of us second, one move. I'll happily second. Oh, okay, that's good. Thanks, Les. Okay, unless Ellen. you don't support the motion. What's that? <laughs> I said unless you don't support the motion. <laughs> so I'll move to approve the contract with Cornerstone. Second. Okay. Any public comments or questions? All right. I'm not, none in my email. Okay. All right. So all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carried. All right. Great. Thank you. Now that Ellen's off painkiller, she's like back in full form. <laughs> yeah. The real Ellen's back. The real Ellen. And yeah. she's back. Not uh, 20, she's less back. than 24 hours post surgery. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And now Leslie Brinson will tell us a couple of small updates to the policy 10080 behavior guidelines and policy for parks facilities. Yeah. Hello, uh, Leslie Brinson, Community Events Manager. Actually, I actually have two policies that have minor updates. Uh, as we've done the last couple months, as we prepare for our next round of accreditation in 2021, part of that is to do a thorough search through the policy manual and just update and fine tune those policies to make sure they're as up to date and as accurate as possible. So these are two policies that have been through that process. Um, as mentioned, 11080 is the behavior policy. The updates to this policy are just to include the word stages when it talks about facilities and parks as um, a location. Um, and we also updated a couple of the where animals were allowed and not allowed. So they are not allowed in the blacktop area of the farmer's market, um, but they are allowed in people's park, which at one point uh, they were not. So those are the changes um, to that particular um, policy. The, the stage was included uh, mostly just because of those that want to sleep overnight in the parks tend to want to do that on the stage. And so just adding that word in there just makes that a little bit more specific to that behavior. Um, the second policy is 13030, which talks about facility access and how we give access to facilities for rental and use purposes. We've just removed MCCSC as a priority partner and moved them to an affiliate um, third priority group. Um, they were a priority partner when we had a partnership agreement where there was a lot of use between MCCSE and parks facilities. Uh, as facilities have been built and grown, the need for that partnership has diminished. And so therefore that moves MCC down to um, the affiliate in that kind of um, structure of use. So those are the only um, two policies that we need updated today and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you. Any questions or comments from board members? No, I see some no's. <laughs> okay, all right. Uh, so do we have a motion to approve the updates to policy 11080 behavior guidelines and policy? Yes, I will move that we approve 11080 and 13030. Oh, yes. Sorry. I keep forgetting to mention the second one. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Um, and do we have a second? Second. Okay. And any public comments or questions about this item C2? I think that we're probably fine. This will be more of an ongoing process. 
Paul and I have talked about it as things unfold in this crazy period we're in, I think there'll be probably maybe more changes than usual given how we keep adapting. Yes, and I our, think that's true. And our accreditation process um, gives us a good tool to do that. So Leslie is, is in the, the policy manual quite frequently. Um, and we, we re really refer to the policy manual often as situations or issues come up. It's our first go-to. Okay, all right. Yes, always good to have an opportunity to update on that. So <clears throat> I don't, if you're not seeing any public comments about this one, we'll go ahead and uh, have the vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All right, motion unanimously carried. Thank you, thank you, Leslie. All right, and then we'll um, hear from Dee Tuttle about a longstanding program with the Bloomington Blades Youth Hockey. I think she. D, D, you're muted yeah, still. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, there you go. Okay. There we go. There we go. Uh, good afternoon, D. Tuttle, uh, Sports Facility Manager with the Bloomington Parks and Recreation Department here at the Frank Southern Ice Arena. Um, today, I'm seeking approval for three long-standing partnerships um, here, and the first one is with the Bloomington Blades Travel Program. And um, this program is for the more serious hockey player between the ages of seven and 12 years old. The association schedules approximately 72 hours of practice time um, a season in the arena and will play a minimum of 22 games um, here as well. The reason I say a minimum of 22 is because uh, the travel program is currently only scheduling up until January 1st and then they will schedule additional games uh, for January and February um, at a later day. They also play uh, away games, and this program is open to all Blades and House players. Um, today we do have Sean uh, Dugan here with us and uh, to say a few things about the program and about our partnership. Yes, uh, this is Sean Dugan. I'm sorry I'm not anywhere i'm in a bit of a, a locker room right now uh I apologize for that but uh yeah we we take kids from four to, to 14 in the, in the youth program uh we love working with the city this year with COVID has been challenging and it's my first year as president uh, i've really enjoyed working with d d has made it very accessible uh to the frank um uh, we've worked very closely on our COVID protocols with the city passing them to, to d uh, we do work with John, uh, and I apologize. This is my first meeting with the city. Is there any questions for me at the time? I don't. Yeah, I don't think so. As you said, longstanding partnership, and uh, uh, I know that someone wrote into the mayor's column in the Herald Times just a couple of days ago and talked about the ice arena and masks, mask requirements, and COVID. And he said, you know, it's it's all been taken care of. So while people are out on the ice, so no, this is a, this has been a good good connection. So I don't I don't have any questions. I don't I see some no's maybe from other board members. I don't know if anyone, Les or Israel or Ellen, has any questions for Sean. I would just say thanks for being a great customer. Yeah. Well, thank you. And, and as far as our COVID policies go, you know, with with Bloomington being the way it is, we're blessed to have a few doctors that. Uh, we put on a COVID committee and, you know, working with the CDC guidelines and, and what they do with their, their practices. I think we have a pretty good plan going forward this year. And, and, you know, hopefully we never have to execute the plan. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. <clears throat> All right. Well, great. Thank you, Sean. Um, do we have a motion to approve the partnership agreement with Bloomington Blades and Hockey Association? Yes, I will move to approve the youth hockey program. And then I think we're also going to hear about the high school program. Yes. Should we, we need to approve those separately then, Paula? Or yeah, Paula says okay. yes, separately. Okay. okay. So youth program first. So move. Second. Okay. Second. Second. And any public comments or questions about this item C3?
Okay. Um, nope, I heard a chime. I don't know if that's a comment. No comment in my email. Okay. All right. So all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carried. And then do you will also tell us about a related agreement with the high school, Blades High School Hockey? Sure. The second agreement I'm seeking approval for is the uh, agreement with the Bloomington Blades High School program. Uh, this program uh, is for individuals uh, throughout the county and surrounding areas. Um, they play their home games here in our facility and they also play um, away games, uh, teams from other areas. They practice four days a week for 20 weeks and they will also play 12 home games. And we have John Hill with us today um, who is the president of the Bloomington Blades High School Hockey Program. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you. Um, this is John Hill with the high school program. I was formerly with the youth program. I just follow my son up through the age groups. Um, <clears throat> we had a really good season last year. We finished fourth in the state for high school hockey. And so uh, a lot of that is attributed to your support of the youth program. Uh, the neat thing about our program is these kids have played together since they were six years old. So um, it's the only team in town. So they get to play with each other year after year after year. And we see the benefit of that when it comes to the highest level of hockey, uh, the high school level here in the state. So uh, thank you for your support. We've got, a, I think, a good shot of the state championship if, if hockey stays open this year. <laughs> and uh, it's just been a real pleasure to work with Dee at the rink. Well, that's great. Fourth in the state, is that's really impressive, John. It's a great team. Yeah. That's really good. All right, do we have any any comments or questions about this agreement with Blades High School Hockey Association? If you, if you might indulge me, I want to sure. say to Dee, it's my sense that we've been very fortunate in both of these programs with some good, strong leadership that really are committed to the program. And my sense is they would probably be fairly easy to work with. and and things, things seem to be working well. I get feedback from various uh, members and so forth. You know, Les, it, it, it's a two-way street. Um, I, I care very deeply about the users and um, we stay in very close contact to make sure that, you know, um, all the rules and regulations are being followed and uh, that we just continue to have a, a really great partnership because um, we are the only rink in town and and therefore, um, you know, we we have an obligation to serve our community and, and those that use our facilities um, to the highest degree. So um, it is a great working relationship and been very fortunate to have great leaders uh, with all these programs throughout the years. And I expect to continue to do so as well. That's great. Yeah, I know certainly the the students I have that are involved with hockey are always really positive about it. And I can see see why, especially if they've been able to play together since they were six and now they're up into high school. So And the same thing goes for the uh, the the, uh, the ice skating figure skating group. Uh, we're just very lucky as a, as a community organization. Uh, it wasn't always that way. <laughs> Dee smiling. <laughs> Turn the tide, turn the tide, Les. Well, a lot of it has to do with you and the staff that has worked very hard with these groups. I appreciate that. We're not throwing chairs over the fence at a baseball game nowadays. No, we're not. No, we're not. <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so it looks like we're ready for a motion to approve item C4. <clears throat> Uh, I will move to approve item C4 for the high school partnership. Okay. We have a second from Israel still flying over the ocean there. And uh, all right. Very jealous. Any public comments or questions? None in my email. Okay. All right. Um, 
All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All right, so that motion is carried. And then D also has, still staying on the ice there, the agreement with the figure skating club. Yes, the final agreement uh, here at the ice, agree ice arena that I am uh, seeking approval for is with the partnership uh, with the Bloomington Figure Skating Club. Um, this figure skating club provides opportunities uh, for Blo the Bloomington community to participate in a diverse skating program for individuals interested in improving his or her skills in the sport. Um, it also provides development of figure skaters beyond the levels um, that are taught uh, in our skating school classes. Um, the figure skating club promotes the growth of figure skating as a healthy, beneficial and excellent recreational activity for the youth of our Bloomington community. And um, the Bloomington figure skating club uh, currently uh, skates 20 to 25 uh, skaters. It, this is also a very long standing uh, partnership. And we do have Stephanie Jacob here with us uh, to provide some information about the program. Greetings. Um, yeah, this is my last year as the club president. Um, we this year have 22 members in our club, a little bit lower than past seasons, um, but we're working with Dee to follow all the COVID restrictions and things of that nature. Um, just, you know, hoping our season will last all the way through. Yeah, I think that's the motto of every, <clears throat> every sport and activity these days. <laughs> Hope we can make it to the end of the season. So, um, all right, well, 22 is still a very, that's a really robust number of, of figure skaters though still. We have a lot that are coming to us now from the parks and rec classes, the learn to skate classes. Um, this year we will actually have five members who graduate and move on. So that's a, that's a good chunk of girls. Um, but these girls like the hockey have skated together since, you know, they were probably 11 and 12. So, um, but we look forward to increasing our numbers and moving on. Um, I don't know if we'll have any ex or competitions this year. Um, right now there are none on the calendar but we still look forward to having our exhibition at the end of the season in uh, early March. Okay. All right, great. Well, thank you. Um, do we have any comments or questions from board members or if not, we'll be ready for a motion. Great work. No, that's, that's great to hear about all these achievements. I agree. As someone who didn't grow up in a climate with winter <laughs> sports like this, I'm I'm jealous of the kids that are learning to play hockey and figure skate at a young age. So that's really great. I did just want to point out, I believe on the first page of the contract that there is a typo. It mentions that the agreement would be in effect from October 20th, 2021. I think it's probably 2020 through March of 2021. Thank you. I will make the correction. Maybe Dee's just done with 2020 and ready to yeah. move on. <laughs> we couldn't blame you. Also plausible. Yeah. <laughs> it's It's been a challenge, but it's it's been a, a good challenge and everything <laughs> is working very well and very smoothly. So um, we will, we'll make it through it together. And the most important thing is people are in here skating and the kids are participating and having a good time. So I'm very thankful. All right. Okay, great. So we have a motion to approve the partnership agreement with Bloomington Figure Skating Club. Yes, I will move to approve the partnership with Bloomington Figure Skating Club. Okay. And I happily second. All right. And any public comments or questions about this one? None in my email. Okay. All right. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All right. Motion carried. Thank you, Dee. You're welcome. Thank uh, you, Lee. Oh, and I guess you are still on here to tell us about the contract with autos parking and marking because we're still in the Frank Southern parking lot here. I am. I am. I'm going to stay on uh, for one more in the Okay. Room. 
Um, so today I'm also seeking uh, approval of the service contract with autos parking marking. Um, this, the parking lot here at the ice arena um, needs striping as the old paint is badly fading. I cannot remember the last time that it has been striped. Uh, we asked for quotes for several weeks and we received back two quotes from vendors in this area. Um, one is AAA Striping Company from Columbus, Indiana, and they gave a quote of $1,080. Um, the other was from Autos Parking Marking from Indianapolis, and their quote was for $728. And um, Autos Parking Marking has done several of our lots, and we've been uh, very happy with their work. So um, this contract is with Autos Parking Marking for $728. Okay, certainly a nice a lower bid and also someone you, you can already trust with this work. Correct. Yeah. All right, any questions or comments from board members? So the, uh, it is mentioned that this company has worked on different other parking lots. Yes, we have used them at, at some of our other facilities, and I believe that they uh, striped the Twin Lake Sports Park uh, parking lot as well. Okay. okay, any other questions or comments from board members? Okay. All right, and um, so do we have a motion to approve this contract with autos parking marking? I will move to approve the contract with autos parking marking. Second. Okay, and do we have any public comments or questions? None in my email. Okay, all right, and all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All right. Motion is carried. So there we go, D. We'll we'll let you we'll let you go. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Good job, D. Thank you. Okay. And then next up will be Aaron Hatch to tell us about the contract with Designscape Horticultural Services for webworm treatment. Probably take a minute to unmute here. Here she comes. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> yep. So I am seeking approval for a contract with uh, Designscape Horticultural uh, Services for treatment of webworm. This is impacting various honey locust trees, both in our parks and along our streets, so our street trees as well. Um, this would be for a systemic uh, injection, um, and this would actually cover treatment uh, that would last multiple years, so much like our treatment for emerald ash borer. It doesn't just cover a tree for one year, it's for a few years. Um, this would be for 575 diameter inches, which is approximately 36 trees that have already been identified um, for treatment. Um, most of these are over in the Covenanter and Clara's area near College Mall is one specifically large, heavily impacted cluster. Um, and we've used Designscape to do similar treatments for honey locusts with this webworm before. Um, and this would be for a total cost of $5,702. And Aaron, can you, excuse me, tell us a little bit more about what type of damage the webworm causes? It's pretty noticeable. Right now, you probably don't see it because now we're reaching fall and kind of winter. Um, but basically, it can uh, cover the trees and lead to defoliation. Um, and they look like massive webs that, that cover the trees. Um, there are a few different pests that produce this. There's Eastern tent worm, but this is one that's impacting these honey locusts in particular. I thought that's probably what you were describing. Yeah, just because I have seen that in some cases. Yeah, okay. It, it's a concern if it is multiple years in a row that these trees are heavily impacted, um, which the ones that have been already identified 
It's not that there's a few branches here and there that could be cut. It's the entire tree canopy or a large proportion. Wow. Okay. I'm just curious, Aaron, uh, were these trees put in, do you think, by the people who developed those areas? So these ones, I can't say in particular. Most of these, they're not small stature. Um, I mean, they're not small in terms of size. They're pretty mature maturing. Um, I wouldn't be surprised they might have been planted uh, as part of the developments because these are near uh, larger apartment complexes, but they are street trees. I think it, it's instructive. I would have guessed this as well, why it's now so important uh, to vary the mix of varieties and do more research when uh, particularly uh, Israel <laughs> sits there on the plan commission and we as, as tree planters uh, pay attention to what we're putting in in the long range. We can't predict an emerald ash borer, but we know that the locusts are probably very prone to this. So anyway, that's yeah. a look I down the road. The, uh, the prior, because we had a treatment in another primarily locust-centric neighborhood, um, I believe last year or the year before last, and that was definitely uh, monoculture from developers. Yeah, it, we can't do it anymore. It gets expensive. Okay. All right, any other questions or comments from board members? I guess I was just curious if I missed this detail, I apologize. Do, do is it, um, we just treat them one time and that lasts for Ever, or is it like ongoing treatment every year? With this particular um, infestation, this particular insect, the concern is more if we get multiple years in a row where it is as heavily hit. So if we treat it now and prevent it from say next year or the year after getting as heavily defoliated as what was happened this year, um, then you might not have to come back because you don't know if it's going to happen again. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not something like with EAB where we're on this rigid, rigid schedule. Mm -hmm. um, but this is just because this might happen or the trees might decline if we have them as hard hit. Um, but it is for about two or three years that it covers the trees. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right, any other comments or questions from board members? Otherwise, we'll take a, a motion on this one. Yeah, I will move to, um, yeah, do uh, approve the contract for the webworm treatment. Okay. Second. And any public comments or questions out there? Nope. Okay. Thank you. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All right. Motion is carried. And then Aaron will also talk to us about ash tree removal at Cascades Golf Course, our next item. So this is an amendment uh, to a previously approved contract from back in July, I believe. Um, with J.R. Ellington tree experts. And this is for, that was for removal of about six trees along the boundary of Cascades Golf Course and adjacent private property. This would be an amendment to extend that contract to include an additional four trees, um, adding $3,000 more to that contract, which would bring it from $9,900 originally to $12,200. And this is for an additional, again, four trees that are declining and, and or dead um, and pose a potential risk if they were to fall onto the adjacent houses. Okay, all right. Um, and these just weren't identified as a risk the first time around in the other yes. population. Okay, all right. What's interesting is I did some quick math on this one. And by going to the 10 trees, we're saving $2,000.
they were about 1600 a pop and with the uh, six, uh, with 10, it's uh, uh, 1,075. The, the pricing is often based on the, the sizes of the trees themselves and also how difficult it is to get to those trees. Yeah, trust me, I know. I took out nine ash. It was pricey. <laughs> okay, all right. Good cost savings then. Any other board member comments or questions? So the findings, the, the additional four trees, uh the, the request is because after certain uh, time it was detected that there we would need more more uh, work on 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 some other trees why didn't this happen before in, in those four trees these four were just not originally identified um this is an area that i foresee ongoing removals that will need to happen um, and it is a pretty densely wooded area. So these four just weren't originally identified, um, but are adjacent, just if you were looking from the residential side, a few houses down. And, and these additional four trees, so all four are because they are dead trees or they are yes. all four? Yeah. There's an interesting question I'd like to ask Paula. Uh, since these are on the property line at the golf course, I, I've sort of wondered before, we have liability responsibilities for these. Have, have you talked to, has anyone talked to the uh, city council about those liabilities? I know this, quite honestly, this group at the golf course is uh, very diligent in their attention to this kind of thing, I've found. Uh, but I, I think there's certain liabilities we're really covering ourselves with here. A absolutely. I mean, we're responsible for trees on our property, and that is what um, the Aaron goes out and inspects. And if we identify any that are on our property, but that um, have that potential liability, if they were to fall over onto private property, um, it could the cost then could be catastrophic. Um, so we are always looking and inspecting and trying to stay ahead of that. Um, and this one area is, is a clear classic case of that, but uh, just yeah. where they're planted and if they were to fall, where the fall radius would be, um, it's best to be proactive and take them out before we find ourselves in a, in a very dangerous or, as I said, catastrophic situation. I brought it up because we fail to realize a lot of the liabilities in this tree thing and uh, they're real. Absolutely, and, and we look at uh, trees uh, you know, that could fall on sidewalks and do damage or fall on cars and do damage. And um, when you think about all the, the trees that Aaron's responsible for, there's, there's a, lot of, um, a lot of risk out there and, and a lot to keep track of. And uh, again, these are clearly dead and um, best move is to take them out. Okay. All right. Uh, yeah. Yes, Israel. Um, yeah. So uh, the private property uh, that might be affected with um, with these trees, which which property are we talking about? Um. So these are spanning a few different houses, a few different private properties, and I believe that the addresses they're adjacent to is included uh, in the scope of the work but they're on Cascades Golf Course property. Um, I can't list off the top of my head, this one tree will fall on this one address, but I believe it is from about 700 to about 800 West Rosewood Drive. Um, yeah, that's what it are is. the properties that yeah. are adjacent. That's a recent development in the last 15 years, I believe. It's fairly new. Uh, and I think we had experience with these people, Paula, on the uh, telephone, the, uh, the, the uh, digital tower, Is that, that's probably the same area. It's the same area, right. And, and again, uh, these trees are on our property and if they were to fall, they could fall on private property. Yeah. Then we're not talking about $12,000, we're talking about a lot more than that. <laughs> 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, sounds like, are we ready for a motion on this one? Yeah, I can move to approve the contract with Ellington, the, or at least the extension of the contract. Okay. Second. And any public comments or questions about this one, item C8? Nothing in my email. Okay. Um, so all those in favor of approval of the contract addendum with J.R. Ellington for ash tree removal at Cascades Golf Course, please say aye. 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 All right. Can, Kathleen, I appreciate yes. indulging me getting into that because very often the viewers don't understand, particularly the prices we pay to take these trees down, the implications that uh, could befall the city as responsible uh, curators of their trees. Uh, so uh, I think that was a good sample of what, 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 there's a lot more to this and Aaron's job is partially to keep an eye on that kind of thing as well. Oh, def uh, definitely, no, I mean, anyone who's ever had a tree in a storm fall in their house or their car or you know they know they know what you're getting into it's yeah it's a lot more than twelve thousand dollars so yeah all right um okay thank you aaron thank you thank you and next up i believe is corey for the con another contract addendum with monster coat to install a vapor barrier on the banneker floor yeah, hi, my name is Corey Hawkins. Uh, I'm the program specialist here at the Banneker Community Center. And I'm seeking approval for a contract amendment with Mo Monster Coat. Um, so a contract with Monster Coat was approved in September to remove the existing rock carpet surface and replace with textured epoxy. Uh, you can see the, the floor behind me here. Um, while removing the rock carpet, uh, Monster Coat identified multiple areas of moisture that was actually coming up through the concrete. Um, in order to ensure the epoxy surface does not bubble or crack, uh, a vapor barrier had to be laid down underneath the epoxy. Uh, this increased the project total uh, by $2,200 and the amount not to exceed the original contract by $1,400. Um, from the original contract, 6,000 uh, to a total of 7,400. Um, staff recommends approval of a contract amendment with Monster Coat to install a vapor barrier prior to epoxy surfacing to address moisture issues at the Banneker Community Center. I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah, I have one question. Uh, it's a small dollar amount, relatively speaking, but uh, do they give you any kind of warranty on this? Yeah, so if we forego the uh, moisture barrier, the vapor barrier, it nulls the warranty. Um, but if we do install that vapor, vapor barrier, we do have that warranty. <coughs> um, and that comes from the manufacturer of the epoxy. And be sure to document that, even do video of the installation so that 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 warranty can be executed if necessary. Yeah, you can find that video of installation on the Banneker Facebook page. Yeah. That's great. And certainly anyone who's done a project knows these things come up. So it's good to take uh, care of it. Yeah, we felt like it was necessary to take care of now while we were addressing the project um, to ensure the longevity um, of the floor itself and the epoxy. Good thinking. Okay, uh, any other board member questions or comments? Otherwise, we'll we'll have a motion then from, I believe, Aaron, or sorry, Ellen's been doing the motions. Yeah, I'll move to approve the amendment with Monster Co. All right, and do we have a second? second. Okay, second. and any public comments or questions on C9? None in my email. Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All right, motion carried. Thank you, Corey. Thank, Thank you very you. much. And D title is back. 
for the services agreement with the stables events for Portalette at Frank Southern. Correct. Thank you, Kathleen. D. Tuttle, Frank Southern Ice Arena Manager. Um, today I'm seeking uh, approval uh, for a service agreement with the stables, formerly uh, Izzy's Rental, for a Portalette um, to be located outside at the Frank Southern Ice Arena. Um, currently, our locker rooms are closed. And this limits um, the restroom availability in our facility to um, just the restrooms in the lobby area, uh, which consists of two stalls in the women's restroom and one stall in the men's restroom. So due to our COVID-19 protocols, um, this limiting of the amount of time people are allowed in the lobby is causing some restroom issues. So I believe uh, with the rental and placement of a um, handicap accessible unit outside the facility when the hockey players are um, getting ready to come into the facility and they are dressing that they can go ahead and use the, the restroom on the outside. So when they come in, they'll have more time uh, to get dressed and to follow the protocols. Okay. All right, so this is obviously temporary and COVID related and- Absolutely, yeah. yes, this is absolutely temporary and COVID related and um, we'll be here until uh, the restrictions are allowed to, to be eased up. Okay, all right. It's interesting, driving around town, I've noticed this happening in other locations, Dee. And it, yeah. I thought, why are they doing that? Now I know. <laughs> yeah. uh, we will locate it. Um, to on the north side of the building um, over by where the dumpster area is to, to kind of keep it out of sight, out of mind. So it's uh, not staring it's, out at Henderson Street. Does look pretty primitive when you see it outside <laughs> a building you know has <laughs> adequate restrooms. Yeah, exactly. Okay, all right. Any other board member comments or questions? Okay. All right, we have a motion to approve the service agreement with the stables, uh, formerly Izzy's Rental. Yes, I will move to approve the service agreement with the stables. Second. Okay, any public comments or questions? Not in my email. Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All right. Thank you, Dee. Thank, Thank you. you. And now item C11 is a review of the 2020 price schedule. So Paula, you wanna kick us off there? Yes, I'll kick us off. Thank you. And first of all, I wanna uh, make a change to your agenda. It should say review of the 2021 price yeah. schedule. I wondered about that. Oh well, yeah. Um, Unbelievably, here we are, October, um, and uh, for our, our new park board members and for the public watching, um, traditionally every October we present a draft of the upcoming year's price schedule, and those are quite extensive. It covers all of our revenue, program revenue streams, um, both general fund and non-reverting, and it's an exercise that staff actually begin um, <laughs> in their budget preparation process, looking a whole year ahead. Um, we do study the market and what uh, other similar services are charging in, in the community to make sure that we don't outprice ourselves. We also take into consideration um, our costs that increase. And just to highlight some costs that increase in our, our general fund budgets every year is obviously utilities. Um, go up in addition to our seasonal hourly wages that we pay, uh, pay go up. So we have to take a comprehensive look at our costs every year and uh, set our fees accordingly. Um, again, it's very important that staff are aware of what the competition and uh, others that offer similar services are charging to make sure that uh, we are not outpricing ourselves. We take a look at the pricing pyramid, our cost recovery levels, and all of that. So this uh, presentation this afternoon is um, to go through the document and outline the program units that are proposing uh, program fee increases for 2021. 
You'll have the opportunity to look that over. And then at your November 18th meeting, we will bring the price schedule forward for final approval. And then those fees will go into place for 2021. It's also an important document uh, as it relates to um, our administrative processes. So for example, when we get audited, it's important that um, what we are charging appears in the price schedule. So um, from time to time in the middle of a program year, we might come to you for a particular price increase. Something's happened or we have a new program. Um, it's important that we keep this document updated with all of our prices that we charge. Um, and going through it this afternoon, Becky will be covering all of the prices in her, in the recreation division. And I will be covering for John Turnbull in the sports division. And there are no price increases in the operations division. So um, I'm going to throw it over to Becky to take you through the price increases in the recreation program division. Becky? Sure. Good afternoon, everyone. Becky Higgins, Recreation Services Division Director. And I am going to go through, as Paula said, the REC Division price changes for 2021 or the proposed price changes. So starting right off the bat, um, and I know you guys have this in front of you, we look at farmer's market and it is broken down um, by April, November, the whole season, um, and then Tuesday and Saturday market. And I can read through each one what it is, or I can paraphrase and let you know that basically what we are looking at is a flat fee of $3 increase for um, vendor spaces per week. And it shows you what that comes out to um, month or for the whole market season from May through October. Um, with that said, that looking at the projection of what we are looking at for 2021, as far as cost recovery, that still puts us at about a 67% cost recovery for farmer's market. So we're in what we are calling a rebuilding stage of market. And we are looking at a five year plan of what it will take us to get our cost recovery back up nearer to 100%, which is what it was. Um, and there has not been an increase in this area since 2011, I believe was the last time that we increased farm vendors. And we've been very sensitive to it, but in an effort to make things a little more equal um, and to bring up what our revenue will be, and more importantly, our cost recovery, that's what we thought to be fair and equitable um, for 2021. The only difference is on our Tuesday markets, um, it's for most of it, it is a $2 increase instead of a $3 increase. It doesn't quite have um, the same draw of people with it um, as the Saturday market does, except for then in the youth space or the senior space on, on Tuesdays, that is also a $3. So there's it's $3 per week per space, except for that one instance on Tuesdays um, where it is $2. And then moving along, um, the, we would go can, ahead can and- Can I interrupt a second? Sure. Yeah, I, I got to get on my old hobby horse just a little bit here. I, I think that could. that's a fairly nominal increase. I can't imagine anybody complaining, even in these tough times. It hasn't been touched for almost 10 years. Uh, secondly, I, I did a, I'm in a calculating mood here. I calculated using about 28 weeks as a normal, uh, 27, April, 27. Well, I miscounted. A You're good seven. though. That's close. Yeah. But at any rate, uh, the, uh, the, the 500 and some dollar, I don't have it right in front of me, uh, mark the rent that works out to be $20 a week total. That is very reasonable. 
it's it 21 like, like, a week yeah and it does it does increase it if you look at just like the large space um the may through october as a reference it increases it from 468 dollars for that period to 567 dollars yeah but my point is it's still only 20 dollars a week uh and i <laughs> I've given up on trying to re, re, revisit some of that stuff, but uh, I really would hate to hear anybody complaining about what they get charged for their weekly, at a weekly level like that. Now, some of them don't show up every time, but uh, right. I, I, I know what others charge, and you know too. And it, given the, the exposure, not now, but a couple of years ago, the exposure was what six thousand a, a week. Uh, that's when I really was complaining about this. But I just throw it out there because uh, it, it's and we got to build it back, or we right. won't be in business. But right. I just put it out there. It's very I, reasonable. I, I hear you, and I can add to that that we are fully aware that you know, as we look at a projection over the next five years, it will go up. We didn't want to, you know, you can hit it really hard in the beginning or you can do it gradually. And as we're rebuilding, we're trying to do it gradually. And we have not heard back negatively from farm vendors and they are aware of it. Well, we went for almost 10 years without an increase. So right. from a business perspective, we need to be increasing incrementally uh, much sooner than that. But no, I have no problem with this at all, and, and given the times, but I just throw that out there as a comment. Can you, I'm sorry, Becky, can you also answer one other question? Um, you mentioned we're at like a 67% cost recovery with this new pricing, and we used to be closer to 100. When was that? When were we closer to 100? About three years ago. Three years ago. Okay. And now and I don't think we'll ever see, I doubt if we'll ever see that, but in even five years. Right. And we're changing our market and we're rebuilding it and we're relooking at it. And we're, you know, currently throwing around ideas for 2021. And, and as of this year, because of the COVID and the changes that we've made, it really went back to a back to basics kind of market. And we foresee that following through next year as well. Um, you know, and and then we can we can move forward from there. Yeah. Did the did the artisan uh, bakery people? Uh, Les, I was uh, just getting ready to do that, and we are going okay. to go ahead and keep that one at the seven point five that we agreed on, uh, seven point five percent of gross, um, because we haven't had, you know, we, looking at twenty twenty, it, it's hard to base a lot of things on that because of everything that no, you changed. Can't. Right. Okay. So that's that's the farmer's market. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and um, go through the rest of the changes for the rep division. So we are adding with both of our stages, you'll see this at Waldron, but um, Hill and Buzzkirk and then over at Switchyard. What we did get was a lot of inquiries from people who wanted to use our stages for outdoor practice for rehearsals um, because it was safer than doing it inside. So we decided to go ahead and add a, uh, a lower cost for those that just need it for rehearsal to use the stage. So we added a $25 an hour rehearsal fee um, strictly for that. So you'll see that increase under Waldron, Hill and Buzzkirk. And then Affair of the Arts we really just, um, we're, we're changing it a little bit. We don't know what it's going to look like in 2021. We are anticipating changing locations perhaps, maybe offering it at different times. Um, we were not able to offer it this season. And so we're looking at, well, if we pair it up with other events happening, concerts, those kinds of things, what would it look like? So we're actually changing the booth space, booth space fee from a flat $60 per Affair of the Arts, which as you know, was monthly, to an actual range.
from $37 to $70. So depending on how we use it, we want to have that flexibility to change um, with the needs of what we're how we're going to present that, you know, it may look, it may happen over at the Tuesday market. It may happen at concerts. We're still debating some of that. So that change you will see in the pricing guide as well. And then moving along to Switchyard Park, a few things that are happening that we've learned. Um, of course, we haven't been able to go through a, a full year of rentals, but had we, we had a lot of interest. We had to have a lot of cancellations, of course, and looking at um, the way that we are structuring the pavilion, we would like to change that from <clears throat> the weekday being Monday through Friday to being Monday through Thursday. Because what we're finding out is there's a lot of people that, you know, the weekend really starts on Friday. So you'll see that change in there. <clears throat> and then the daily rental fee, we were charging a, a per hour of $60 per hour. And that got to be very confusing because people wanted to rent it for the specific time, but not like their setup time or their teardown time. So what we did is actually change that to instead of a per hour rate, it's, it's for a four hour time block. So you either rent it for like the morning or the afternoon or a four hour time block. So that went from $60 per hour to actually 250 for a four hour time block. <clears throat> And then weekend and holiday rentals from, again, 75 per hour to 300 per four hour time block. Um, we are adding a projector renter, rental fee because we have a very high quality system in there. And um, it, it's, it's worth every penny of the rental that's still low it went from $25 to $50. So if you have an event in there and you need to use the projector, it would be a flat $50 fee. And then <clears throat> we're removing the table and chair reset fee in case people have changes in their setup because we haven't found that to be an issue or um, something that we actually need to have in there. So that's it for the, the pavilion. Under the lawn, outside of the pavilion, <clears throat> We're changing the wording from amphitheater to pavilion lawn. It doesn't sound like much, but it helps um, distinguish the different areas, the geographical locations. We found that people were getting caught up in calling things that a different name than what it really represented. So we're trying to make that a little simpler. And then um, we remove any rental costs for the boss area. We haven't received it any for that. We want to go through a year, see what happens if people are really interested in it. If it becomes something interesting, you know, or requested, we can always re-examine that again for 2022. We're really just anxious to get through a, a year. Um, and then under the North Activity Lawn, again, from Monday through Friday, it's Monday through Thursday, is the weekdays. And the main stage and performance lawn, the hourly practice fee for rehearsals on that stage will be $50 per hour. And we removed the different categories that talk about theatrical lighting. At this point in time, we don't have theatrical lighting there. Eventually we hope to get it there, but we were just trying to update the pricing schedule to be accurate. And, re and only other thing we have, um, is the fitness in the park permit. As you know, we came to you last month and had that changed to an hourly permit form to more represent the way that things were being used. And I think that's it. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you for detailing that, Becky. And just so I can be clear, is what you're calling BOSC, is that what I call bocce? Like with the no. rolling? No, that's different. No, no, no. And I have become a bocce ball player. So if you oh, ever okay. Okay. Um, the Bosque is just outside of the shelter house and it's those long green tables. Okay. That will have the trees and it's it's an open air seating area. Um, okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It has the same lights as the bocce ball court. It does. Yeah. Okay. Those are nice lights. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. 
and I, I do, yeah, I do appreciate your detailed explanation and also the, the low cost changes and no changes in a lot of places. I know it's incredibly hard. I mean, how can you plan for anything when this whole summer has been kind of a wash? And the best estimates I'm reading are, I'm reading experts saying expect some sort of better normal by next June, but that's not 100% normal. So it's, you know, it's really hard to predict as you say, it, I'm glad there's a five year looking ahead sort of recovery plan. Yeah. So I think we will obviously we'll take board member questions and comments. And I think um, Eric Shedler also wanted to make a, a public comment, which we might have here. But go ahead, board members, do you have a, a comment or question for Becky? Well, I mean, I just think it makes sense that the switch yard is going to undergo changes probably mm -hmm. every, you know, for a while as you figure out, well, number one, it just opened. Two, it's opened for the first time during a pandemic. So your demand is going to really increase, hopefully in the future when we're all safe and healthy and able to kind of, re, you know, get to a new normal. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think those are all great changes. And I mean, I think it's um, the best we can do knowing what we know and then knowing that next year we might be having this, you know, same, some other new changes to things. Uh, one last comment, I think. Uh, I think it's a really good idea, Becky. I sense you're trying to brand the areas a little more carefully so that people will know what you're talking about in maybe five years. It will probably take that long, but you take the car show down there. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that worked out. Everybody understood where it was, but the Bosque is going to be a little more difficult, but I, I think you're on, on a really good path with that. So. Okay. Yes, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, Becky, I have a question. So regarding the Swiss Yard Park, so the daily rainfall from 60 per hour to 250 per four hour time block. Is yes. That, right. Yes. So, so the, uh, that would mean that just four hour time blocks will be allowed or can People also do the the season. No, no, no. One twenty. Right. People could people can rent it for 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 longer. They just can't rent it for less. For less than four. Right. Four hours. Right. So not so not just one hour. So. No. Okay. Thank you. If I if I rec seem to recall, that's that's a fairly normal practice on a an event facility or for that kind of thing. Yeah, it is. And it's similar to what we've seen around. And it, it just got too difficult to try to do it by the hour. No. Because it's you, never just an hour. Yeah, your hotels will rent a, a, a major room for a minimum of four hours. Now, the question I have is, as you move into the sixth, seventh, and eighth hour, are you still renting four-hour blocks from the first floor? You're, you're running it, gosh, Les, you might have stumped me on that one. Um, I believe the only change we had was making it from, um, let me see if I can find that really quick to answer that. I, I want to get it, I don't want to answer it wrong. It can still be rented for the day, which would be an eight hour day. Um, for which is which is five five hundred dollars, and that's that's how it was. We weren't changing that. We were just okay. changing it. Yeah, from the hourly to the four hour. Right. I, uh, I, I think that's a good idea. So after the fourth hour, if you want to have more time, it won't be allowed to have six hours. It should be eight hours. Yes. And did you say, Becky, I can't remember, did you say the, the setup and the teardown is part of your rental time or isn't or? 
the setup and the teardown, if you need to get, say you're running something, you have an event at 10 o'clock. We were getting people who wanted to come in at nine o'clock or eight o'clock or even drop off things the day before. And, and so it, that hour of their meeting from 10 to 11, all of a sudden got to be really like three hours long. So we found this to be, it was confusing to people. Actually, it was more confusing to people to have it per hour than it is to just say it's a four hour time block. And, and our cost is still extremely reasonable because our goal is still to get people in there. And it was um, really very heavily scheduled in for this year that, that you know, of course, changed. And I, we anticipate that the popularity will still be there. Um, and we may look at it next year and say, well, the price needs to go up for 2022. But right now, we're just trying to even it out to make it easier for people to understand and easier for us to manage it. And okay, thanks. Uh, yeah, one, sure. one question, yeah, with the, with the devices. So we have judged the projector to be rented for $50, right? That's mm -hmm. the only and then, uh, so that would be, um, I would imagine for the, for the whole time, it's uh, like a, an eight hour event or four hour event. The, that's the fee that the, the, the yeah. that fee for the projector. Yeah, we don't wanna, we're not trying to nickel and dime people, you know, and, and we found that just a flat fee was, was what we think was fair and reasonable. Right, no, I'm, I'm saying for the language because it can be ambiguous, like, uh, it could be, you know, for the for the whole event or or the uh, because some places and, and I work with conferences in and in, in the hotel uh, charges per hour the use of a projector. So it would yeah. be better to clarify that that is not just per hour but for the whole event. Right, and we've listed it in the guide if people look at it that it says per day so that they understand that. Okay. Okay. All right. Any other questions or comments from board members? And do we have any? Uh, well, we'll take. We usually take the. Do we? Are we voting here? We yes. Okay. So are we? Uh, uh, we're just, just reviewing, right? Yeah. Sorry. Oh, we're reviewing, but before you before you move on, I do have um, the golf course has a couple of changes as well. I just okay. want to bring to your attention. Oh, sure. Um, and again, I'm filling in for um, John Turnbull on this. And hang on just a second. And just to clarify, yeah, we'll, we, we will ask again for public comment. Here. Yes, yes, let's get yeah. through this and then you can all yeah. comment and then ask for public comment and everything that uh, we've presented this afternoon. So uh, just drawing your attention to page uh, 13 in the price schedule um, to the golf course um, and just uh, reminding everyone of the incredible investment that we've made to this property over the past two years through the general obligation park bond with a $1.3 million brand new uh, pro shop and clubhouse and then um, putting Zoysia fairways in on all three courses. Um, and uh, business has been really, really good. It's been a couple of years since we've had done any price increases out at the golf course and um, Staff have submitted, um, just drawing your attention to um, really a range of increases anywhere from $5 uh, to $25. Uh, I'll just run through these quickly. The um, 18 hole and cart uh, special um, was a $5 increase, so it's now $35. Uh, green fees went up $2, uh, nine hole, uh, green fees went up $2 and the twilight green fees uh, went up $2. Uh, adult season passes uh, went up $25 and uh, a spouse season pass, a $20 increase. A family season uh, pass was a $75 increase. Our senior pass is a $20 increase. A junior season pass, $20 increase. And a uh, student over 18 with a valid student ID is a $25 increase. Uh, and then the nine hole 10 pass, play pass, a $10 increase. And same with the 18 hole 10 play pass, a $10 increase. And then just finally the student green fee with a student ID went up $2 and a family day green fee 
um, on Sundays went up $2. So uh, again, with the investment, with the uh, utility increases and uh, staff per hour salary increases and in that, these are, um, again, also we take a look at what other golf courses are charging and we are still a very, very good value uh, for the quality of the course out there. And again, all of the amenities that we have um, newly built out in that location. Okay, yes, thank you. In another lifetime, I used to play a ridiculous amount of golf. And yes, these are, these prices, I still have a habit of, if I'm in some community and I notice a golf course, I'm just curious about what they charge. And th these are very reasonable, very, still open to somebody who just wants to play casually and doesn't have an expensive set of clubs and a rate for teenagers. And yeah, so it looks very reasonable. So- I, I absolutely agree with you, Kathy. Uh, the adult only 5%, family 10%, and I think family should have gone up a little more be, because uh, <laughs> you want them to get out and play. And if they're paying for it, they're gonna get out there. The numbers on golf are not good nationally, uh, from what I'm hearing, and so anything we can do to stimulate that, and these these prices are really stimulating prices, given the value they're getting in terms of increases. And I'll have, uh, oh, go go ahead. Ahead. No. I'll have I'll uh, have John at the end of the season give you a an update on. Uh, the revenue out there and the numbers out there, we've had we've had a really, really good season despite COVID. Um, people have really picked up playing golf and uh, we're really pleased with our numbers out there. Um, so we'll, we'll do an end of season wrap up report for you. One thing too to look at, I think is the in city and out of city. Look at, look at the numbers of people from out of the city that are playing and how much revenue do you get for such a small increment and the administration of that. Uh, we've slowly moved away from that over time. And this might be another area to look at like that, Paula. Okay. Okay, all right. Um, yeah, I know golf has been down nationally, but during COVID, it's like one of the few things you can actually do, so. Um, I've heard cycling is the new golf. <laughs> But maybe I should take up golf and it would be safer sport for me. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't think we are, if I'm reading correctly on our agenda, we're not actually voting because we're just reviewing and we're voting the next time around. Correct. So. Right. So this feed that back that you've given us today is very helpful. Uh, we'll do some follow up and then yes, we'll bring this to you again in November for your final review and approval. Okay, and I think we do have a comment that was sent to Julie Ramey, a public comment. Yes, there is a comment from Eric Shedler via chat. The comment says, you mentioned a five-year plan to rebuild the farmer's market. I sincerely hope any rebuilding plan includes the strong desire on the part of many in the community to see an end to a white supremacist presence at the market. These concerns won't go away and be forgotten with time. While the market continues to work for some vendors and some customers, it won't work for the whole community without major changes. Okay, all right, thank you, Julie. And thank you, Eric, for the comment. And yes, I, I know that that issue is, is something that the advisory council is still discussing and board members I'm sure will be, be revisiting as well, so. Thank you for that. Um, and then we the follow towards the bottom of our agenda here, we have a couple of reports then. Steve Cotter, Griffey Lake Aquatic Vegetation Management Update. That is correct. Thank you. Steve Cotter, Natural Resources Manager. And I'm here to give a Griffey Lake Vegetation Management Update. I'm doing so on behalf of Leif Wiley from Aquatic Control Inc, who does the lake management out there. He has a conference right now, so he's not able to present. Uh, however, I did see him present it to Iraq 10 days ago, so it's fresh in my mind. So I'll go ahead and try and 
share my screen here. Does that work? Not yet. This is, Steve, this is like my every class at school all day long. I know what you're going through. <laughs> at least no students are muting you. So. Well, I'm on my Mac. I wonder if I would have better luck doing it on. Sometimes the screen share on Macs is, I found, is a little odd. Yeah. That's certainly. Steve, let me try. I've just pulled it up. Um, let me okay. see if I can share. Um, Don't mind. That would be great. Oh, yeah. Now we got it. Very good. There you go. Thank you very much. And I will just, I'll move your slides. Okay, thank you. Because I saw it too at ERAC, so I think we can do this. Great, thanks. Yeah, and so this is the 2020 Griffey Lake Aquatic Vegetation Management Plan Review and Update, uh, and it was done by Aquatic Control, Inc. Next slide, please. Uh, the LAIR program is funded by boat registration fees. It's administered by the Department of Natural Resources, Division of Fish and Wildlife, uh, it's basically for the control of invasive aquatic plants. Uh, we get a 80% match. So we, we provide a 20% match and the LAIR program pays 80%. Um, there are also maintenance grants available and they require a 50% match. And for our last grant from LAIR, we received $11,600 for the treatment of Eurasian water milfoil and the Aquatic Vegetation Management Plan update. Okay, next slide. Uh, aquatic plants are good for lakes um, as long as there's enough sunlight, substrate, the, the soil, and nutrients. Most aquatic plants are beneficial to the lake. They reduce erosion. They provide cover for fish and insects. They improve water quality and clarity and food for waterfowl. However, some species can cause problems. Okay, next. Uh, Eurasian water milfoil is the, the plant that we've struggled with most at Griffey. Um, it is a submersed plant, but it grows up all the way to the surface and can completely fill the lake. It can grow up to over a foot of stems per day per plant, and it spreads through fragmentation. So if a little piece breaks off, it can move around to another part of the lake or it can end up downstream somewhere. Uh, it is not good for wildlife and it definitely shades out the native plants, which are good for wildlife, and it decreases the use of the lake by fish. Uh, as I mentioned, we've been working on this plant for a while. Uh, we tried uh, biocontrol using weevils in the early 2000s. That did not work. Uh, Brazilian Eladia eradication treatments in 2006 and 2007 uh, were successful. Uh, we did put signage up at the ramp encouraging people to clean weeds off of their boats and trailers before they launch or leave. Uh, we've done curly leaf pondweed treatments in 2008 and milf water milfoil treatments in 2009. Uh, due to some dam uh, repairs. The lake was uh, drained in 2010, and that definitely knocked back the Eurasian water milfoil. Uh, the treatments resumed in 2016 using a different chemical uh, that was a uh, the active ingredient was coated with clay, so it would sink to the bottom and slow release. Uh, then a new chemical, Procellicor, came on line and we were able to reduce the herbicide application uh, a great deal. So we're happy with this new chemical. Uh, next slide, please. In 2020, there were two surveys done, a spring invasive survey and a late summer invasive survey. Uh, the spring survey done in, on May 26 showed that there were about nine acres of Eurasia water milfoil, which was less than half of what we saw the year before. 
Uh, and we approved through our IPM program the use of this new chemical, Procelacor. And it is a safer chemical and it reduced the amount of um, chemical that had to be used. The um, PDU is a prescription dose unit and there were 76.5 applied in 2020, whereas there were 185 prescription dose units used in 2019. Uh, so it was just about two gallons. Um, okay, so yeah, a, a great deal of reduction in the weight was due mainly to the clay that is, was used around that uh, active ingredient. Next slide, please. And this shows where the Eurasian water milfoil was found during their survey in the spring and uh, the treatment areas are defined by those yellow boxes. Um, it is mostly in shallow water, um, including the, the shallowest part of the lake at the east end on the east side of Headley Road. Okay, next. Uh, they did the summer survey on October 3rd. They found no Eurasia water milfoil, which was amazing to us um, or any other invasives at, for that matter. Uh, there was uh, the most common native plant collected was coontail, which is supposed to be around here. They also found slender naiad, American pondweed, water star grass, filamentous algae, uh, water willow, hibiscus, pickerel weed, creeping primrose, cattails, and arrowhead. Uh, the secchi disc measurement of five and a half feet is a measure of water clarity. And uh, that's not as good as Griffey Lake usually shows. There have been some uh, intensive developments in the watershed that we think have put some sediments into the lake. Uh, so we're hoping that that clears up in coming years. Uh, the recommendations from Aquatic Control Inc. are to continue with the surveys in spring and summer, uh, and then do the tier two in late summer, tier two survey, uh, and then treat for Eurasian water milfoil in the spring with this new herbicide. Uh, earlier treatment helps with selectivity, meaning that it is more likely to impact the invasive plants rather than the native plants. Uh, the cost per acre will be similar, but the acreage should be less in this year. Uh, continue with public meetings if safe and plan updates um, and continue to work on improving the shoreline stabilization and potentially uh, watershed improvements outside of the nature preserve. And they recommend that we um, more closely monitor the boats coming onto and leaving the lake. Okay, so we will be meeting tomorrow uh, with the layer permit biologists to discuss the aquatic vegetation management plan and uh, plans for treatment next year. The draft is due on November 15th and Aquatic Control Inc. will submit that to DNR. Uh, we will apply again by January 15th and um, we have a permit application due by the 1st of February. Uh, layer grants are awarded in February, March and then send out, we'll send out bid requests to uh, contractors in March and decide on a contractor by late March, early April so that we can uh, have the treatment done early in spring before the water warms up. And I believe that is the last slide. I'd be happy to try and answer any questions. Okay. Um, I, well, it sounds like, I mean, there's some very positive things there. Um, still not, not completely over all the hurdles out there, but sounds very positive and less pes pesticide use, less chemical use. So I was wondering about the, I know you've had the signs, I've seen the signs out there telling people to remove weeds and things from their boats and it mentioned more monitoring of that. Do you think that would just be gathering information about how many people are actually following the, the signs or what do you think that would be? I think they're referring to actually visually inspecting the boats and trailers coming off and going on to the lake. Okay. That, that can be problematic when we're busy down there for staff to make time to do that, but we will certainly include that uh, recommendation in there 
staff training next spring that they look more closely as boats are coming on and off. Okay. Yeah, I was just out there, I think a week ago and boy, it was, it was popping with people. So yeah, I can see that would be, you'd have to keep on top of that. Definitely. Um, any uh, questions from board members for Steve? I think the fact that it grows a foot a day. <laughs> yeah. It's crazy. And I've been out there to run a paddle board and you're like, and then that east side of the lake is so, it was so bad with them to get through that, you know, to paddle board through that and then get out to the clear water. Yeah, absolutely. The weeds can prevent people from using the lake for recreation. And of course we don't want that. So it's, right. it's better for the native species in the lake and it's better for recreational users to get the weeds under control. Yeah. Okay, any other comments or questions for Steve? I just never thought about the invasive species being in the lake. Yeah. <laughs> most people don't, they're out of sight, out of mind for most yeah. people. <laughs> All right, well, thank you. Thank you, Steve, thank for filling in there for like, yeah. yeah. All right, and then I think, are we back over to you, Paula? To wrap yes, us up. Yeah, I want to say thank you to, to Steve as well. That's a great program and uh, always look forward to this presentation every year to see the progress that we're making. And uh, uh, Steve and Rebecca do a really good job in getting that grant funding lined up um, early in the year. So it sets us up nicely for the rest of the year. So look forward to implementing those, rec those uh, recommendations. It's always, a, as I said, a very informative report. So thank you. Uh, just a few announcements. Uh, tomorrow, we are recognizing uh, CFC and Duke Energy down at Twin Lakes Sports Park. Uh, we were the recipients of a CFC Properties $5,000 uh, donation and a Duke Energy Foundation $5,000 grant um, almost a year ago to um, redo a couple of landscaping medians down in Twin Lakes Sports Park. They were the original donors way back when that uh, sports park opened and uh, it was looking kind of sad down there all the way down to the new sign. So tomorrow we are gathering as Joanna and uh, Marie and their staff have uh, redone the medians down there. We have a brand new sign. So we'd like to uh, gather and recognize uh, both CFC Properties and Duke Energy. If you can make it, we'd love to have you at four o'clock tomorrow afternoon. And then the next board meeting will be November 18th, a little bit early, the week before the holiday. We like to, to get that done then at four o'clock. And I can say it will more than likely be via Zoom. So Kim and I will stay after that and keep you informed. All right. and that's all I have from my end. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Good Thanks. to see you all. Yes, good yeah. to see you too. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you very much, everyone, staff and board members. Um, and I believe we are adjourned for October.